Hi everybody, where are the Girl Scouts? <laughs> Yay! I was a Girl Scout. I'm proud of you. <laughs> what a gorgeous group of people here today. Thank you, Mia. It's a pleasure and an honor to stand here before you today, especially at such a critical moment in history for women in our society. Never before have there been so many young women made possible in part by the tough, resilient women who came before, who for decades demanded and fought for equal opportunity and fair treatment for all, at home, at work, and in society at large. And yet every day we face an onslaught of reminders of just how far we need to go. The gender pay gap remains, far too many industries still fall short when it comes to females in leadership roles. And the Me Too movement has highlighted a lingering sexism that for too long was considered just a part of doing business, even today in our news. But the fact that now we're not just talking about these issues individually, we're doing something about them collectively, shows how far we've come and what's possible when a few resilient women turn into many. Here are pictures of my two revolutionary granddaughters. <laughs> Lucy, Lucy at Middlebury College, she needs to learn how to plan ahead, and uh, Danielle, who graduated from the New School um, at a march in New York City, and if anybody can explain to me what the heck that banner says, I would love to hear it after my speech. My story begins when I was 19 years old, and instead of finishing college, I decided to start uh, by opening my own advertising agency. And by the time I was in my early 20s, I was divorced with two children, one with special needs, and I was also responsible for 13 employees. I faced the daily battle that came with being a woman in the 1960s in the advertising world. Anybody here ever see Mad Men? I rest my case. <laughs> and yet in the middle of all that turmoil, I still found time to feed the political animal inside of me, working at getting out the vote for 18-year-olds and marching to end the war in Vietnam. A year later, I met my future husband, business partner, and best friend, Stuart. <laughs> My family's going on in the front row. We joined families and forces and started to work together to build a business that would become the wonderful company. But don't try to work th with your husband at home unless your resilience is really, really resilient. <laughs> on our fifth date, I confessed to Stuart that I once Xeroxed some top secret papers. He didn't believe me. But he did believe me months later when the FBI came to the house armed with a subpoena to appear before the grand jury the next morning. You see, I owned an A12 copier that Daniel Ellsberg used to copy the Pentagon Papers, which would eventually end the war in Vietnam. I was on trial with Dan as an unindicted co-conspirator. Those two years of not knowing my future took a heavy toll. A long career in business looked less likely than one in the prison laundry. But with resilience, we got through it. I didn't go to jail. I got 90 seconds in the movie The Post. And I, I still hate laundry. <laughs> Family helped, especially as we merged our two broods, Stuart's three kids and two of mine. I gave them a common enemy to bond over. And today, <laughs> These 45 years later, we have a great marriage. Five children, some of them are here today. They're not even children anymore, but we keep calling them kids. Four grandchildren, and if you'll indulge my pride for a moment, two years ago, this is the wedding photo of our son Bill with his soulmate, Michael. I win as the bride. Over time, Stuart and I built the wonderful company into a global enterprise full of iconic brands that I hope you and your family enjoy. Wonderful pistachios, wonderful halos, Fiji water and palm wonderful. And there's a goodie bag for you today to take home and enjoy. But a few years ago, at the age when most people start thinking about retiring, I was thinking about my next career. 
I had worked hard achieving a successful business, a beautiful family, and a great marriage, but I still had the energy and passion to do much more. I needed a purpose in my life. And it was that realization that led to another one. I wanted to somehow repay the success by living my second life in service for others. I knew writing checks to charities wasn't the answer. In the end, I had what they call an epiphany. The greatest beneficiary of my efforts should be the people most responsible for our success, those 5,000 employees and their families living in the Central Valley, the fertile valley that is often forgotten. I was scared. I was starting over. I still had my day job to do, and besides, who was I to come into this depressed, underserved community with my dowager rose-colored glasses and tell them how to live, or what they needed? Thank you. <laughs> I mean, what did I really know about poverty? But there's so much need, it can be overwhelming. I didn't know where to begin, so I did what I always do in business. I started with research. Most of my fellow Angelinos are blissfully unaware as we enjoy our kale salads and fruit smoothies that the Central Valley is America's salad bowl. It's where two-thirds of our nation's fruits are grown, 90% of the nuts, a third of our vegetables, and yet, believe it or not, it's a food desert. In the Central Valley, the land is rich, though the people working there are not. But what they are is resilient, as you'll soon see. So the work began slowly and with focus. I began to build a smart, dedicated team who cared as deeply as I did. And in 2010, we dove in. Stewart suggested we start by checking out a town where we had donated 13 acres so they could build a community center and a park. Let me know how it turns out, he said optimistically. When we approached the area, there was no park. There was no community center. There wasn't a single blade of grass. But what we did discover was a hotbed of municipal corruption. Because the city turned our donated land into an impound yard where local police would store cars confiscated from undocumented immigrants for no apparent reason at all. And if these folks didn't fork over $1,500 within 24 hours, the police would sell their cars and split the profits with the community manager. Who the hell is responsible for this, I yelled into the abyss. Silence. Spying the sign for Tom's towing on a nearby truck, I demanded to speak to Tom. What was I thinking? <laughs> Out of the bowels of the building, sauntered a six foot five tall fellow covered in tattoos, trying not to be distracted by the fact that his greasy t-shirt didn't even cover the generous belly slung over his waistband, <laughs> uncomfortably level with my own eyes. <laughs> I started talking. I think he thought the quiver in my voice was a sad speech impediment. Had I lost my mind, things could have gone very wrong, but Tom simply told me to go see the city manager and complain to him. You see, you can't tell a book by its cover. Tom told me to go fight City Hall. He was helpful after all. <laughs> Long story short, we busted the ring. The police and city manager are gone, and that beautiful town is off to an exciting rebirth. That's why I covered their name. I didn't want to give them a bad name. So our education continued. My research started with Dolores Huerta at her proverbial knee to learn all I could about the history of neglect going back to the early farm worker protests. We poured over maps. We met with school boards, county health officials, the police, sheriffs, the firemen. Most were happy to hear of our involvement and fully supported our efforts. Others were told by their superiors not to even talk to us. Disappointing, but we were not deterred. Our orchards span 200 square miles in the Central Valley that is economically and emotionally challenged on every front. So there were more than a few towns of underserved communities to choose from to start our work. But in the end, we realized 
the best place to start was in the little town of Lost Hills, just 13 miles from our pistachio plant where we grow and process 500 million pounds of pistachios every year before shipping them off to hungry snackers here and across the globe. This was Lost Hills eight years ago. They had truly been lost and neglected by the county, the state, and the federal government. Through door-to-door -door surveys and numerous focus groups, we learned that families came first. Everyone's primary concern was for the well-being and safety of their children. And on that front, things weren't looking good. The gates of the schoolyard were locked at 2.45 every afternoon. There was a rundown park, but it was full of drunks and the smell of marijuana was so intense you could get a contact high from standing in the parking lot. <laughs> Don't run there, it's over. <laughs> all the kids, all the kids had was a derelict basketball court with a giant crack down the middle, and they actually had to leave their car lights on at night so they could play in the evenings. So the first thing we did was build the brand new, beautifully hit, lit basketball court for Lost Hills. Next, we put in sidewalks and street lights and storm drains and paved the roads and planted drought-resistant landscaping. We hired the Lost Hillians to work right alongside and taught them trades in the process. Today, Wonderful Park has two community centers, two soccer fields, basketball and volleyball courts, and a wider range of community programs from English as a Second Language to computer instruction, ballet classes, church on Sundays, but we didn't stop there. We helped build Almond Village, 82 affordable single-family homes and apartments for ag workers with rents ranging from $350 to $700 a month, depending on each family's income. I'm sorry, we can't offer them to you unless you're ag workers. <laughs> but it, it's... It's awesome to see these houses are off the grid. They have solar panels, they have three bedrooms, two baths, and a huge backyard. And we even helped secure the town's first polling place because disenfranchisement comes in so many forms. But before we could take a victory lap, we quickly realized that all this good work had turned to dust without further incentivizing the community to take care of what is theirs. We invested in infrastructure, but to create a deeper connection between the residents and their town, we needed to invest in them too. And we started by creating the Lost Hills Community Advisory Board to run the town and to manage the $250,000 to $500,000 a year of tax money we lobbied the government to return to the town each year. Until then, they had never gotten a dime. The logical next step was to invest in education. A few years before my involvement started, our company had started a charter school in Delano, not far from our citrus plant. Back then, the name of our company was Paramount. Well, we hadn't done such great research, uh, and there were other good public schools in the area. The local county officials were less than thrilled that we had a charter school in their midst. There are only two charter schools in the whole Central Valley. So when this test score started to falter, they pounced. The state planned to deny our charter renewal unless the API scores went up at least seven points. This was an alarming introduction to our education work, but there was no time for hand-wringing. We hired Noemi Donoso, who is sitting right here. who had been the chief education officer for Chicago Public Schools, and she helped run our education program. She runs our education program. I figured if she could survive Chicago, she could handle the Central Valley. <laughs> we called a town meeting with all the parents and the teachers and laid things out plain and simple. If we don't turn our test scores around, our school is going to be closed. Noemi and I didn't know what reaction we were going to get. Nobody speaks to schools about the truth these days. We were trembling. We were scared. What happened next was one of the most inspiring moments of my life. There was a heavy silence. 
as they saw how poorly they were doing compared to other schools in the valley. But the parents, the staff, the kids, none of them pointed fingers. None of them ran away, quite the opposite. They rallied. As the mic passed from parent to teacher to student, each pledged to do whatever it took to save the school they loved. Tears were flowing, but so was gratitude. And we got to work right away. Christmas break and spring vacation canceled. We buckled down, worked long, hard hours. Noemi slept on the floor of the basketball court. We studied. We did it. Test scores needed to go up seven points for the school to remain open. In four short months, we raised our scores 48 points. That's grit. That's determination. Those teachers, those parents, those students inspire us every day, and that is the day that Wonderful Education was born. Today, we've built an extensive, successful academic program across the valley, starting with our two best-in-class preschools, supporting students every step of the way toward high school diploma, getting those grads enrolled in and staying in and graduating from college, and helping with job placement. Through our college scholarships, career pathway programs, two charter schools, teacher grants and summer schools, the arts and dance, We've already reached 55,000 students in 83 schools in 24 school districts. Our wonderful college, uh, college scholarship program helps students and parents alleviate the financial and emotional burden associated with pursuing higher education. We've already sent 2,000 kids to college, but this year, we will be awarding 225 scholarships to our employees' children and the graduates of our charter school. It's our biggest group yet. Our job doesn't end with commencement, as you all know. You know better than anyone that getting into college is just the beginning. Some students call us their guardian angel and some their worst nightmare, but we don't mind being both. We have a college success team of specialists who are assigned to specific universities to support our scholars with academic tutoring, social transition, crisis management, and anything else they need to earn that college degree. In short, we stalk them, making them do all we can <laughs> so they can succeed. But just as we were making dramatic strides, the local school board doubled our rent, forcing us to build a completely new campus. And that turned out to be a gift in disguise. Because of them, that first failing school has morphed into a dream school. A couple of miles away from our citrus plant in Delano is our new charter school, the Wonderful College Prep Academy. This state-of-the-art campus already serves 1,100 students, and at full bell out in 2019, we will have 2,000 preschoolers through 12th graders on the campus every day. This school offers everything students need for academic success, including an innovative curriculum uh, that adapts to each student's individual needs, not to mention longer school days and longer school years, and a student body in which everyone has a path to college, all tuition free. And of course, what makes the most are the numbers. We've come a long way. Our high school today is number one in Delano in English and math. And while neighboring schools have approximately 30% college going rate, we send 100% of our graduates to a two or four year college. <laughs> 76 percent are attending four year programs. We are sending kids to Dartmouth, Stanford, Berkeley, and right now we have eight students at UCLA. <laughs> but the really great news that our college retention rate is 75%. Compare that to the national average for first-generation college kids, which is just 11%.
After the state published our test scores, the local district inexplicably canceled our school bus contract. <laughs> Apparently our methods or our audacity upset them and we scrambled and found another transportation provider. Similarly, in Lost Hills, we made a proposal to the local school district to partner with them and open a charter school, partly because their test scores across grades were really the worst in the valley. And also, there's no high school in Lost Hills, so the Lost Hillian kids have to ride in a bus an hour each way with no air conditioning, which is pretty onerous in the summer. The community was overwhelmingly in favor of the proposal, but the superintendent blocked our predict petition without justification. We appealed his decision to Kern County Board of Education and won approval and last fall in the town of Lost Hills we opened the second charter school which will eventually be preschool through 12th grade. It will be a real game changer for these kids since currently only 10 percent of Lost Hills children enter high school on grade level in reading and math. Our signature program is called Wonderful Agriculture Career Prep, and it is in seven high schools in Kern and Kings County. Students start ag prep at the end of eighth grade and graduate with a high school diploma and an Associates of Science degree through high school, again, tuition free. We teach them the skills they need for the new high-tech ag industry jobs that we quite frankly need to fill ourselves. They can either enter our workforce with a guaranteed high-paying entry-level job of $35,000 a year after they graduate high school, or they can go on to a four-year and enter as a junior, finishing in half the time. And while it's not easy, these incredible kids are what keeps us going. These stories of survival against all odds compel us to never rest, never let a setback stop us in our mission. And although I'm proud of some of the personal moments of resilience in my life, they pale in comparison to this work. They really pale. Take Manny, for example. His parents have worked for us in Lost Hills for 20 years. He is the youngest of four boys. He's the first to graduate high school. He's the first to stay out of a gang, and believe it or not, He's the first to stay out of prison. Manny was determined to make a better life for himself, so he applied himself in high school, got into Fresno State, and earned a 4.0 his freshman year. That's what you call resilient. Marissa is just as amazing. When Marissa was in second grade, her mother started using and dealing drugs and her father abandoned the family. Marissa and her mother were forced to spend the next couple of years Living out of a car or in shelters, anger and depression followed, and Marissa attempted suicide twice. But in 11th grade, with the help of counselors at our charter school, Marissa's outlook changed. She realized that a good education was her only ticket out of poverty. Though homeless for the better part of her high school years, this tough-as-nails young lady worked hard to achieve a 3.2 GPA while also completing college level courses. She even became the class treasurer and captain of the track and field team. And now a senior, Se uh, Marissa has already earned her associate of science degree and has been accepted at four year programs at five different universities. Despite poverty, homelessness, and a lack of family support, Marissa told us this is what keeps her going. People have always expected me not to graduate high school, she said, but I asked myself, am I gonna let them be right, or am I gonna push myself? Well, Marissa, you are what pushes us. What, but, what good is all this if our people in the Valley don't live long enough to take advantage of it? If the beneficiaries of the work we're doing are going to die eight years before they should because of diabetes and heart disease, we really haven't solved much. To lead a life of wellness, success, and happiness, these families needed the proper tools and care. Let me put things in perspective. Obesity and diabetes are among the biggest problems in America today. These maps are from the Center for Disease Control. The darker the color, the worse the problem. Obesity is on the left, diabetes is on the right. 
The darker the color, the worse. Over the next two decades, obesity and diabetes have ris risen at epidemic proportions. Look at those maps. Left unchanged, imagine what this map could look like five years from now. But what the maps don't show you is that 84 million people in America are pre-diabetic. Mia knows. She does the testing. And many of them don't know it. New research has shown that diabetes accounts for 12% of the deaths in America, making it the third leading cause of death after heart disease and cancer. The problem is even bigger in California's Central Valley, where one in two adults and almost one in five children are obese. And unfortunately, it's even worse in our own company, where 90% of our employees and their families, who are first generation and haven't received the best education, are suffering. These folks have some of the highest incidence of obesity and diabetes in America. An internal survey conducted in 2015 revealed that 48% of our employees are obese and a total of 85 are either obese or overweight. 12% of our employees have diabetes, higher than the rates in the U.S. and California. And as it stands, 87% will have full, pre or full diabetes by the time they reach their 50s. This is an epidemic that is actually affecting the whole world, but it is affecting our country in rural America and the inner cities especially hard. To begin to find a solution, my team and I conducted in-depth and often heart-wrenching focus groups among our employees. Understanding the stress of their everyday lives is a start. They are the working poor, the heart of the heartland, the most industrious and closely knit group of humanity I have ever known. They have been reduced by the system, never feeling comfortable enough in their own land to have a voice. All of our employees have legal status. However, you can bet that there's someone at home, aunt or grandma, who takes care of the kids who probably doesn't. But even with immigration issues breathing down their backs, they are the most warm and loving people I know. So when they told us their reasons for not taking better care of themselves, like it's too time consuming, they're afraid to hear the truth, Diabetes is God's will. I know how they must feel. Even their relationships can get in the way. Hey, I cook those refried beans and rice because my husband wants them. The husband tells us, well, well I, I eat them because she's cooking them and I don't want to get her feelings hurt. And I thought Jewish guilt was bad. <laughs> Pretty quickly, we knew we needed to start a robust health and wellness program throughout the Central Valley orchards and processing plants. We already had a provider on site, but only 15% of the appointments were being filled. They didn't have a bilingual staff. The doc came once a week, if ever, and our health care costs were going up double digit. So we fired the health care provider, and we started interviewing others. And after interviewing 26 health care providers, we realized, insanity, that we had to do it ourselves. What was I thinking? There's really lives at stake. What if we screwed up? But let me tell you, very often the thing you have to be most resilient against in life are your own doubts and fears. We created wonderful health and wellness to attack the problem at every front. The workplace, the home, the schools, and the community. Stuart and I are obsessed with healthy eating and exercise. <laughs> Yoga and stress reduction, sleep hygiene. Yeah, I'm a hypochondriac. And I know that doesn't make me a doctor. By the way, I'm on the left and Stuart's on the right, in case you're wrong. <laughs> but we were lucky enough to find healthcare professionals that believe, as we do, that wellness must be taught. And what a great opportunity this was to really impact public health in a controlled environment among our employees. Keep the healthy feeling healthy, get the sick and failing on a path to a cure, or at least able to control the condition. We have a holistic approach that puts personal empowerment at the heart of it all. A little over two years ago, we opened our two wonderful wellness centers, one in Lost Hills and one in Delano. 
These modern welcoming clinics are staffed with full-time doctors, nurses, dietitians, health coaches, and physical and social workers, physical therapists and psychiatric social workers. Big problem is stress. Most importantly, our health experts take a team approach. They work together, creating a holistic program to help employees and their families change their health by changing their habits. Our wellness centers are warm and nurturing, brightly colored, completely confidential, comfortable places for the entire family. There's even a special area for the kids to play in their own waiting room. Here's one of our exam rooms. Doctors visit, tests, treatment, medication, all free. And our doctors and nurses, all bilingual, take their time with each patient to explain every issue and answer every question in Spanish or English. All of our patients are assigned to health coach to help them year round with their personal ideas of how to re eat right, including nutrition, portion control, recipes, and menu planning. Our coaches also develop tailored exercise programs and offer techniques for managing the stress of their full and busy lives. We conduct diabetes workshops, giving employees paid time off, of course, from work to attend. Our plants, we have on-site gyms, we have stretching and walking activities built into each shift. We supply free, fresh, healthy snacks at the break rooms every day. We also offer affordable, healthy meals at our cafes with many recipes based on employees' favorite dishes. They're low fat, low salt, zero sugar, and full of flavor. We have a fresh produce market at our plant called the Mercado, where whole food quality, way below Walmart prices, are available every day. We're the low price leader. <laughs> And those employees and their families who don't live close to the wellness center, we even bring the doctors to them with our mobile clinic. So how's it all working, you'd ask? Well, in 2016, 50% of our employees were pre-diabetic. Today, I'm pleased to report that number is down to 29%. <laughs> that is a 42% reduction in one year that's life-changing for our patients and their loved ones. But since a picture's worth a thousand words, uh, or a thousand numbers, I'd like to show you a few of our folks who've lost weight through self-discipline, perseverance. Some of these guys hit the gym at 4 a.m., showing restraint at the dinner table and turning new choices into lifelong habits. And when I set out on my life's second act, I didn't know what to expect. I didn't have all the answers. I didn't even have all the questions. But as I look back on all we've accomplished, I can think of there's so much more to do. That's the funny thing about having a passion in life and a purpose, backed by determination to see your plans through. It's addictive. The tougher the going, the tougher you get. I see every day in the faces of the people we serve in the Central Valley their happiness. Their courage inspires us to be braver, to never take no for an answer, to find a way around, under, or through the walls that stop us. Courage takes the first step, resilient keeps you walking. In your careers, you will face a myriad of obstacles, many that you never saw coming. But whatever your personal Tom's towing hell may be, Take comfort in the enormous strength you have within you. Let your resilience be your sword and your light. Thank you for this opportunity to share our work. I so appreciate it. Thank you.